Under the turquoise surface, a silent predator awaits. With senses exceeding human comprehension and a body honed for the kill, sharks rule the ocean depths. Millions of years of evolution have shaped them into perfect hunting machines. From the colossal great white to the reef's silent stalker, these magnificent creatures inspire awe and terror. But what happens when our paths collide in their domain? Join us as we explore the chilling true stories of those who face the jaws of death. The sun beat down on the turquoise waters off the coast of northern Australia. Dr. Elias Thorne adjusted his goggles, a flicker of anticipation in his eyes. This wasn't just field work, but an escape from the endless grant proposals and cramped labs back home. He was in his element amidst the dazzling coral reefs of the Flinders archipelago. Elias had always been drawn to the ocean. Growing up in a landlocked state fostered a lifelong fascination with its mysteries. He wasn't a daredevil, more a methodical mind who loved solving nature's puzzles. Now in his 40s, his weathered skin and laugh line spoke of countless expeditions. Yet, even with a wife and two daughters waiting back home, the call of the wild always lured him back. His research focused on the Flinders' unique population of bull sharks. Renowned for their aggression and ability to survive in freshwater, they were both a terrifying marvel and a scientific enigma. Along with his assistant Maya, today's dive was meant to map their migratory patterns further, which is vital in understanding their impact on the ecosystem. It was early June 2000. A warm day on the Flinders was a contrast study. The scorching sun versus the shocking chill of the deeper water, the vibrant life teeming just below the deceptively calm surface. Elias and Maya checked their gear, a practiced routine honed over years of working together. He glanced at Maya, her dark eyes sparkling with a shared passion for their work. The dive began smoothly. Sharks were naturally wary, their keen senses detecting them long before any visual contact. The trick was patience, observe but don't intrude. Elias tracked a few smaller specimens, noting their behavior. Then, a flash of movement, much more extensive, bolder. A mature bull shark approached 10 feet long and built like a torpedo. Bull sharks didn't get this big without a healthy appetite and a bad attitude. Yet the calculated way it moved suggested curiosity, not immediate hostility. They monitored it cautiously, Elias snapping photos as it slowly circled them. He recognized the pattern the shark was testing and sizing them up. This was its territory, and these strange, bubble-blowing creatures were potential rivals. He felt excitement. This was the kind of encounter he lived for. He signaled to Maya that it was time to ascend. The ascent was slow, a safety precaution ingrained in Elias. That's when it hit. A surge of adrenaline masked the initial wave of pain. The bull shark struck from below, the force of the impact knocking the regulator from his mouth. Water rushed in, panic threatening to drown him. He thrashed, instinctively kicking at the massive shape now tearing at his leg. Maya screamed through her regulator, bubbles swirling in agitation around them. Elias wasn't a fighter by nature, but survival sometimes demanded brutality. He clawed at the shark's eyes, gouging for any purchase. Its rough hide scraped his bare hands bloody. Another vicious snap and searing pain shot through his calf. The world was contracting, a red haze blurring his vision. He had seconds. With a desperate surge, he shoved the heavy camera at the creature's snout. The surprise impact bought him a split-second advantage. Elias grabbed Maya's tank, propelling them upwards. The pain throbbed in waves, nausea swirling in his gut. His vision was tunneling, the surface an impossibly distant speck of light. They broke through, gasping for air. His leg was an explosion of agony. Maya got him to the boat, the small craft now awash in blood. She screamed for the satellite phone and fumbled with the emergency beacon. Her words barely registered in Elias's ears. The shark circled, relentless in its hunger. Each agonizing bump against the boat sent fresh shockwaves through his mangled leg. It lunged again, narrowly missing Maya. They were sitting ducks, a gruesome feast just waiting for it to claim. The time it was fractured. Was this how it ended? Not in a lab, in some sterile hospital bed, but devoured piece by piece here. A strange clarity washed over him his daughter's faces laughing in the summer sun, his wife, her gentle smile, the steadfast belief in his work even when it took him so far away. With desperate strength, Elias ripped off his weight belt, the remaining air tank attached. Hefting it over his head, he roared defiance, 
slamming the tank against the water next to the boat with all the force he could muster. The shark flinched, startled by the noise. He did it again and again. The tank pounded the water, creating a confusing cacophony. Finally, the relentless shadow disappeared back into the depths. Elias collapsed, his body a flaming wreck. Maya's voice was distant, muffled. She was securing a makeshift tourniquet, the radio crackling with the crackly voice of the Coast Guard. Help was on the way, but he knew it might be hours. The water was chilling, and with his blood loss, hypothermia was a real threat. The sun began its descent a final indignity. Was this it? Survival was never about winning. It was about enduring. He looked up at Maya, her eyes brimming with determination. They'd make it. They had to. Night settled and still, they clung to life. Floating in and out of consciousness, Ilias heard the chopper before he saw it. Rescue, a chance. But his ordeal had only just begun. The hospital was a blur of lights and needles. He underwent emergency surgery, hovering for days on the knife's edge between life and permanent disability. The shark took more than his leg. It took his certainty. The ocean, once his playground, now loomed as a vast, unpredictable threat. Yet the human spirit is stubborn. Through grueling rehabilitation, Elias relearned how to walk and navigate his life with this brutal new reality. Support from his family, from Maya, and a surprising outpouring of concern from the scientific community became his lifeline. He never returned to fieldwork. Instead, he found new ways to contribute. His research focused more intently on shark conservation, driven by a chilling, hard-earned understanding. The Flinders Archipelago remained a bittersweet memory, a testament to the fragility of life and the enduring power of survival. The wind whipped through her hair, a salty sting on her face. Lyra James's lips stretched with a smile as she surveyed the endless blue horizon from the deck of her sailboat, the Sea Gypsy. This was her element, the wildness of the open ocean calling to something deep within her. At only 25, she had already logged more seamless than most sailors twice her age. Unlike many born into a seafaring life, Lyra was an outsider. She grew up in the Hirt of Landlocked, Colorado. Her only connection to the ocean through faded library books and grainy documentaries. Each page, each flickering image ignited her imagination. By 16, she worked odd jobs, saving every penny to buy a battered old sailboat on a nearby lake. Her parents watched, a mixture of pride and exasperation warring on their faces. She studied marine biology via long-distance courses, devoured navigation manuals, and took any crew position. Today's solo voyage was supposed to be simple, navigate from the coast of South Africa towards the remote islands of the Tristan Archipelago. The notoriously rough waters here were infamous for shipwrecks, but Lyra saw them as the ultimate challenge. The archipelago's rich marine biodiversity, including great white sharks, was a powerful draw for the fearless young woman. It wasn't just the thrill, it was the knowledge she craved to witness firsthand the creatures she'd only read about. It was late October 2002 as she traced her planned route on her chart. The skies were clear, but she knew how quickly things could shift, especially in these treacherous waters. She checked and rechecked her equipment and secured her supplies. This boat wasn't just her transport, it was her lifeline. She thought of her family back home, rolling their eyes in fond resignation at her latest adventure. She was used to their worry mixed with grudging admiration. Sending a quick satellite message to reassure them, she settled in for the night. Lyra wasn't reckless, but she wasn't driven by caution either. Growing up watching nature documentaries sparked her passion. Sharks fascinated her, not as monsters, but as apex predators playing a vital role in the ocean's delicate balance. She dreamed of encounters, of understanding them on their terms. The first days of the journey were exhilarating. Dolphins escorted her for a while, their playful leaps a good omen. She slept in short bursts, the rhythm of the waves lulling her into a trance-like focus. But she knew this was just the calm before the storm. The Tristan Archipelago wasn't some tourist destination. It was raw, untamed, and a stark reminder of nature's unpredictable power. And it was getting closer. The change came with brutal swiftness. One moment the sea was a heaving expanse, the next a churning, frothing nightmare. 
The wind roared, tearing at the sails. Lyra fought for control, but the sea gypsy was like a toy in the hands of an angry giant. Rain lashed down, visibility shrinking to mere feet. The storm wasn't just around her, it seemed to rise from the depths, and the ocean was a raging beast. A towering wave slammed into the boat, knocking Lyra off her feet. Scrambling back, she saw the mast snap like a twig. Despair washed over her, without the sail, she was at the mercy of the current. She grabbed emergency supplies, stuffing them into a waterproof pack. Her heart pounded in her chest, a mix of fear and defiance. Then it happened. A colossal surge and the boat capsized. Lyra was plunged into the icy water. Instincts took over. She fought her way to the surface, coughing and gasping. Looking back, the wreckage of the sea gypsy was getting steadily smaller, leaving her frighteningly alone. She trod water, trying to get her bearings. Then, she saw a dark, triangular fin slicing through the turbulent water. Her blood ran cold. Not one shark, but several. Great whites circling like vultures around a dying animal. Panic threatened to drag her under. She knew screaming and thrashing about would only attract them. Forcing herself into a semblance of calm, she began to swim slowly towards a piece of debris, a broken plank that floated a short distance away. The sharks closed in, their movements eerily graceful in the storm's chaos. Reaching the plank, she used it as a makeshift shield, keeping it between herself and the hungry predators. One shark bumped it experimentally. Her muscles screamed with the strain of holding her position. Time was both endless and fleeting. She wasn't going to die without a fight. A flare. It was in the emergency pack strapped to her waist. Fumbling with numb fingers, she launched the fury burst, illuminating the stormy ski for a few seconds. Perhaps someone would see it, but hope seemed a foolish luxury now. The sharks regrouped, their methodical circling tightening the noose. One surged forward, its massive jaw snapping at the plank. The force splintered the wood, sending Lyra tumbling back into the water. She kicked desperately, desperately attempting to escape those gleaming rows of teeth. Then a searing pain shot through her arm. A shark had clamped onto her. Terror was a blinding, primal force. Somehow, in the struggle, her hand found the flare gun. She shoved it into the shark's open maw and pulled the trigger. The flare ignited, the beast suffered excruciating pain and released her. In the fiery chaos, the other sharks retreated momentarily. Bleeding and in shock, Lyra scrambled onto another piece of floating wreckage. The morning was breaking and the storm was finally beginning to ease. Exhaustion threatened to take her, but she clung to consciousness with grim determination. Rescue might come, or it might not. But she wouldn't make it easier for the sharks by giving in. Hours passed. She saw things that weren't there. Her family, her room, a shark's open mouth. She could barely breathe. Was this it? Would she die here, forgotten by everyone? Then she saw it. A helicopter, tiny against the clouds. They saw her flare. Hope burst inside her. She waved even though her voice was gone. The helicopter got closer. She wasn't dead. She was going to live. The ocean floor was an alien world bathed in perpetual twilight. For Jonah Thorne, it was a homecoming. He'd logged more hours underwater than most people spend on land. His company, Thorne Marine Solutions, specializes in the riskiest of deep sea operations, salvage, recovery, and underwater construction. If it was difficult and dangerous, chances are he'd done it. Today's dive was different. This wasn't about a job. It was about discovery. He was off the coast of South Africa, exploring a recently mapped cave system in the remote Addo Archipelago. Rumors whispered of lost pirate treasure hidden centuries ago, but the cave fascinated Jonah. This labyrinth of limestone tunnels was a marvel of geology, teeming with undiscovered life forms. It was early July, 2003. Jonah stood alone on the dive support vessel, a converted fishing trawler serving as transport and his floating workshop. His seasoned crew knew better than to question his more exploratory expeditions. The dive was a solo endeavor. No one had the experience, or quite frankly, the recklessness to join him. His wife, Sarah, had long ago accepted his unusual obsession, but not without a fight. He thought of his son, 
barely past his first birthday, leaving them behind, gnawed at him, a counterpoint to the thrill of the unknown. Jonah was geared up in his custom rebreather, the closed circuit system allowing longer dives. The dive lights attached to his helmet cut through the murky water. The cave entrance loomed like a monstrous mouth, promising wonders and danger. Great white sharks were common in these waters, top-tier predators accustomed to patrolling their territory with impunity. These giants were responsible for numerous attacks in the Addo archipelago, their hunting ground for seals and other prey. But Jonah's dive plan minimized open water exposure and he was armed with deterrence, a powerful electric pulse repeller and a spear gun as a last resort, hopefully enough to keep even the most giant shark at bay. Descending into the inky depths, a strange peace washed over him. The surface world, with its relentless demands, faded away. He moved slowly, methodically, taking readings and documenting his path. The cave's walls were alive, pulsating anemones, bioluminescent creatures casting an eerie glow, a world unseen by most of humanity. It was humbling, a stark reminder of the ocean's vast mysteries. Jonah pressed deeper into the cave system, a maze of twisting passages barely wide enough for his bulky gear. His light pierced the gloom, revealing vibrant mineral formations and the occasional darting fish. The silence was deafening, punctuated only by the rhythmic sound of his breathing. It was exhilarating and more than a little unsettling. The first sign was a subtle vibration in the water. Jonah froze, his heart pounding. Years in the ocean had honed his instincts. That wasn't a natural current. Slowly, he turned and saw it, the unmistakable silhouette of a massive great white shark patrolling the cave's perimeter. His blood ran cold. He was in its territory, a trespasser in its domain. He inched backward, keeping his eyes on the creature. He activated his electronic shark repeller, a last-ditch defense that emitted a pulse to confuse their electroreceptors. The shark flinched momentarily but didn't retreat. It was far too large. The deterrent might be an annoyance. Jonah knew the drill, stay calm and don't make sudden movements. Sharks are reactive hunters, show weakness and become their prey. Yet the cave walls constricted him and a claustrophobic nightmare came to life. The exit was a distant speck and escape was nearly impossible with the shark barring his path. The shark circled, closing the distance. Panic threatened to overwhelm him. He fumbled for the spear gun, his hands clumsy within his thick dive gloves. His air supply was dwindling, each breath precious. Every second was a lifetime. Then it charged, a torpedo of muscle and teeth hurtling towards him. He fired the spear gun, more out of desperation than hope. The spear glanced harmlessly off the shark's thick hide. It swerved at the last moment, the cave walls scraping its sides. That's when Jonah saw a narrower passage, just big enough to squeeze through, a chance, however slim. He lunged for the opening, wedging himself into the tight space. The shark slammed into the rock, sending debris around him, but it was too large to follow. Trapped in the narrow confines, Jonah watched, heart pounding, as the shark thrashed in frustration and retreated. He wasn't accessible, just more profound in the maze. His air was getting dangerously low. Panic swelled in his chest again. He forced himself to breathe slowly, to think. Jonah had cheated death, but the game wasn't over. He had to find a way out, or this cave would become his tomb. He moved deeper into the narrow tunnel, his light beam barely able to illuminate the path ahead. The passage twisted and turned, a seemingly endless labyrinth that would test his sanity as much as his oxygen supply. Jonah started marking his path, desperate to avoid getting lost entirely. Exhaustion was his new enemy. He couldn't afford mistakes and couldn't allow despair to take over. With each agonizing gasp of recycled air, Jonah pressed forward. There had to be another way out. There simply had to be. Then, a flicker of light ahead. Was it his imagination playing tricks or an actual opening? The light grew stronger. Hope, a fragile and foolish thing in his desperate situation, flared. He kicked harder, ignoring his burning lungs, his body protesting with each movement. The tunnel opened into a cavern far more significant than the previous ones. A burst of sunlight speared down from above, an exit. With a strength born of desperation, he propelled himself upwards. He broke the surface, gasping and choking, the sunlight a blinding fire after the eternal twilight below. The support boat was a reasonable distance away. 
He was too far to swim, especially in his condition. Jonah signaled frantically, waving the small emergency flare attached to his gear. The boat seemed agonizingly slow. Was he losing consciousness already? Then he heard it, the roar of the approaching engine. He didn't know if he had the strength to climb aboard, but he didn't need to. Strong hands reached down, pulling him from the water. His crew, their faces a blur of relief, screamed in relief. He collapsed on the deck, every muscle screaming in protest. Someone wrapped a blanket around him and shoved a water bottle in his hands. He gulped it down, his body finally starting to shake from the shock of everything. It was over. He cheated death twice in one day. Jonah Thorne was done with underwater caves. He craved sunlight and the open sky, the blessed normality of breathing fresh air. Laughter echoed across the beach, fueled by cheap beer and salt-kissed skin. It was Maya's idea, a spontaneous getaway to escape the oppressive summer heat of Beaufort County. Her childhood friends, Emily with her bold spirit and infectious grin, and Ben, the steady and reliable one, didn't need much convincing. A weekend at a secluded coastline along the mesmerizing Morgan Islands off the coast of South Carolina seemed like the perfect antidote to their mundane city lives. It was the first Friday in August 1998, the fiery day finally giving way to a breezy evening. Their rented beach cottage was charmingly rustic, mere steps from the ocean. The day was spent the way all good beach days should be, sunbathing, half-hearted attempts at building sandcastles, and splashing in the surprisingly warm water. For Maya, it was bliss. A marketing executive by day, she rarely had uninterrupted time with her oldest friends, who knew her before her career ambitions and complicated relationships. Now, as darkness enveloped them, a bonfire crack led, casting their faces in a warm glow. After a dinner of grilled hot dogs and off-key singalongs, a sense of reckless abandon washed over them. The Ocean Beconid, a velvety expanse under a star-studded sky. Maya felt a prickle of unease. Shark attacks were rare along the South Carolina coast, but not unheard of. Bull sharks, in particular, were known to venture into shallower waters, especially at dusk and dawn. Yet, the allure of the moonlight on the water was irresistible. Maya's life was full of calculated risks. This felt like a delicious slice of rebellion against her usual caution. They tossed their towels aside, their laughter echoing across the deserted beach. Emily, as usual, was the first in, the water closing over her head with a gleeful shout. Ben followed, his hesitant steps betraying his reluctance. Maya was last, a shiver of mingled fear and exhilaration tingling down her spine. The water was shockingly cool after the warmth of the bonfire, enveloping them in its inky depths. They trod water, their voices hushed, the vastness around them suddenly unnerving. Out here, they were vulnerable, out of their element. The first sensation was a jolt, an unseen force bumping against Maya's leg. She froze, her heart pounding. A fish, just a large fish, wasn't it? Then, Emily shrieked, a piercing sound muffled by the water. Maya thrashed her head around just in time to see Emily dragged under, swallowed by the darkness. Maya couldn't move, couldn't process. Her mind fumbled for answers, a prank, a riptide, anything but the sinking realization that pulsed through her veins. A shark. It was a shark. Something brushed against her again. A powerful surge. Then an explosion of pain shot through her calf. Sharp teeth sank into her flesh. Instinct took over, a primitive fight-or-flight response. Maya kicked unthinkingly, screaming even though she knew it would only attract it back. She broke free, adrenaline masking the searing pain. Ben was ahead of her, swimming for shore with desperate strokes. Maya matched Ben's frantic pace. The beach, their only hope, was an unbearable distance away. But the shark was faster, a relentless predator in its territory. It surfaced next to Ben. One gruesome strike and he was gone, a sickening plume of red blooming in the water. Maya was alone, the horror of it all finally sinking in. The beach was still so far and she was bleeding, leaving a trail the shark could effortlessly follow. Panic threatened to consume her. She couldn't fight it, not out here. But giving up meant certain death. Maya forced her limbs to move mechanically, fixing her eyes on the shore. She pictured the cottage, the warmth of the fire pit, and the remnants of their dinner scattered on the porch. Then a glimmer of hope. 
A wave crashed, and Maya saw a dark outcropping of rocks protruding from the water closer to shore. It was not safety, but perhaps a temporary refuge. She shifted course, summoning the last reserves of her strength to push ahead. Reaching the rocks, she scrambled onto their rough surface. Her wounded leg buckled, sending her crashing down. Maya looked back, her breath ragged. The shark circled, its movements agonizingly slow. She was out of reach for now, but it was only a matter of time. Waves crashed against the rocks, threatening to wash her back into its waiting jaws. A hysterical laugh bubbled from Maya's throat. She, a city girl, who analyzed market data for a living, was trapped here, crouching on a wet rock awaiting her demise. Tears mixed with the salty spray on her face. Then an image flashed in her mind. Her parents' worried faces, phone calls unanswered. Her last thought couldn't be of despair. She had to find a way out, had to survive, but how? The shark was getting impatient. It lunged at the base of the rocks, gnashing its teeth, sending a cascade of cold seawater over Maya. Terror gave way to a strange resolve. She wasn't going to be a passive victim. Her eyes scanned the surroundings, seeking anything she could utilize. Her shredded wetsuit offered no protection, and the flimsy material was like a cruel joke in this battle. Suddenly, she remembered the flare Ben packed in his waterproof bag. It was a long shot, but it was something. Scrambling back, her injured leg throbbing, she found the half-submerged backpack tossed aside by the turbulent water. Inside was the emergency kit, the flare her only chance for signaling. She fumbled with the package, her fingers clumsy with adrenaline and seawater numbed cold. Each passing second felt like an hour, the shark's movements growing more frantic with hunger and frustration. The flare sparked, casting the surrounding water in an eerie crimson light. Maya waved it wildly, her shouts lost in the crashing waves and the roar of the wind. The shark honed in, likely more confused than deterred by the sudden brightness. Despair gnawed at her. Perhaps it was foolish hope after all. Then, in the distance, Maya saw lights. A boat, faint at first, then growing stronger, cutting a path across the inky water towards her. Was it a dream, a cruel trick of her desperate mind? The boat came closer, the thrum of its engine a lifeline against the despair. She waved the flare with renewed vigor. A spotlight pierced through the night, blinding her momentarily. Then voices called out through a loudspeaker. The Coast Guard was alerted by a late-night fisherman who'd glimpsed the faint light of her flare. Maya couldn't even muster a cry of relief, only a hollow laugh mixed with shuddering sobs. They pulled her onto the boat, her legs nearly useless beneath her. The paramedic patched up her wound, his actions feeling strangely distant, as Maya stared numbly at the spot where Ben and Emily had disappeared. She survived, they didn't. The unfairness of it all would stay with her, a permanent scar matching the one on her leg. The ocean, once a place of wonder, now held only the echo of unseen predators and the ghosts of lost friends. Dr. Ethan Rhodes was a man obsessed. For years, he'd studied sharks, their anatomy, behavior, and the intricate dance of predator and prey that played out in the ocean's depths. Most called him brilliant, some called him a madman. He preferred the term visionary. His controversial research centered on a radical idea. Could sharks be influenced, perhaps even controlled, through specific sound frequencies? It was with precedent. Dolphins communicated through their complex language. Elephants used low-frequency rumbles to coordinate over vast distances. If sharks were as intelligent as Ethan believed, they would have their ways of signaling each other. The trick was deciphering them and replicating them. Today was the culmination of years of work. He was off the coast of South Africa, in the remote Addo Archipelago, renowned for its abundance of great white sharks. It was early December 2005, the waters teeming with the predators as they followed their annual migration routes. Ethan wasn't a diver, his expertise lay in the lab, not the open ocean. But his latest prototype equipment was designed for field testing, a submersible drone carrying an array of underwater speakers. The converted fishing boat, the Oceanus, served as his makeshift research vessel. His small team was a mix of skeptical marine biologists and sound engineers. They humored him and he paid them well. It was a tenuous symbiosis. Ethan knew the whispers behind his back, reckless, irresponsible, more interested in proving a point than advancing the field. He was used to it. True breakthroughs were rarely born from conformity. 
He stood on the deck, peering into the murky depths where his drone would soon descend. The drone wasn't just wired for broadcasting sound waves, it was outfitted with powerful hydrophones, recording any response. He dreamed of hearing it, a pattern amidst the background noise of the sea, the guttural voice of a predator echoing back at him. Ethan's wife, Sarah, had begged him not to do this. A respected oceanographer in her own right, she understood his obsession, but not the risks he was willing to take. Their fights became more frequent and their silence became even louder. Yet, Ethan couldn't stop. He felt he was on the cusp of something groundbreaking, a discovery that would revolutionize how humanity saw these ancient creatures. The drone descended, its blinking light swallowed by the murky water. Ethan hunched over his console, headphones clamped on, listening intently for any change in the background rhythm of the ocean. At first, there was only the familiar, the crackle of crustaceans, the distant echo of whale song, the hiss of the current against the drone's hull. Then he heard it, a low guttural pulse that stood out against the other sounds. It wasn't natural, not something he'd heard on countless research recordings. His heart hammered in his chest. Was it a response? Was he picking up on a shark's communication? Encouraged, he activated his equipment, broadcasting a sequence of frequencies he crafted to mimic echolocation clicks. The response was almost immediate. The guttural pulsing grew louder and faster, and a new sound joined it. A scraping, thudding noise against the drone's hull. The team exchanged worried glances. The hydrophones picked up something significant, moving very close to the drone. Switching on the drone's cameras, Ethan scanned the murky depths. A shadow emerged from the gloom, growing more apparent with each passing second. It was a great white shark at least 15 feet long, its massive body rippling with barely contained power. It wasn't reacting as he predicted. Instead of circling, curious, it charged the drone, teeth bared in an unmistakable display of aggression. Panic flared through Ethan. Had he stumbled upon a threat display, a warning he hadn't even known existed? Based on his limited data, the sound sequences he played back were meant to be non-threatening. But sharks were unpredictable, apex predators at the top of their food chain. Perhaps he had unwittingly provoked it. The shark rammed the drone, the impact shaking the entire boat. Ethan fumbled for the frequency cutoff switch, but it was too late. The great white struck again, its teeth gouging the drone's metal casing. Warning lights blinked on the console as systems failed. The shark wasn't just attacking the drone, but going for the kill. Up on deck, the crew scrambled. They couldn't risk pulling the drone up with the shark attached. It could quickly flip the boat. Ethan knew this wasn't a random attack, but a direct result of his experiment. Guilt gnawed at him as he watched the shark tear into his prized equipment. Had his arrogance closed his eyes to the potential danger? The comms unit crackled. His assistant reported another shark approaching, then several more. The dying drone's commotion and vibrations drew them in. Soon, Ethan's experimental playground turned into a feeding frenzy. There was only one course of action. He slammed his fist on the console, barking the order to his crew. His voice was ragged with fear and frustration as he watched years of work vanish. With a jarring jolt, the cable was severed, sending the mangled drone spiraling into the darkening water. The sharks tensely fixated on their sinking prize and then their focus shifted. The boat became their new target, a tantalizing silhouette against the fading light. Ethan knew he wasn't safe. He turned the boat about and raced it back towards the shore. The sharks followed, their menacing silhouettes just below the surface. He wasn't just a researcher anymore, he was prey. At the harbor, an ashen-faced Ethan relayed the events to the skeptical Coast Guard. His story was met with an agonizingly familiar mix of concern and skepticism. He'd have to live with the questions and the accusations of irresponsibility. But that night, as Sarah held him while he shuddered from the residual terror, there was only one truth he couldn't ignore. He'd come far too close to proving his theory about communicating with sharks, and it almost cost him everything. The air crackled with excited chatter as the tour boat pulled away from the bustling dock. This was Sarah Evans's long overdue escape from the daily grind. A newly single mom struggling to balance a demanding tech job with raising her seven-year-old daughter. This Caribbean getaway to the San Cristobal Islands, 
was meant to be a chance to breathe, to reconnect with the adventurous spirit she felt slipping away. Around her, a mix of tourists buzzed, a honeymoon couple holding hands, a family with boisterous kids, and a pair of retirees clutching guidebooks. It was July 3rd, 2009, the start of a holiday weekend. The boat skimmed through the turquoise waters, the lush green slopes of the main island giving way to smaller, uninhabited ones on the horizon. The captain announced their destination, Isla Sirena, a speck known for its pristine beaches and snorkeling. Sarah had done some research. The waters around the island teemed with colorful reefs, but there were also large populations of various shark species, from sleek reef sharks to imposing tiger sharks. The boat anchored offshore, ferrying passengers to the beach in smaller groups. Sarah felt the thrill of anticipation as they waded through the warm, shallow water. The others spread out, most eager to sunbathe or plunge masks first into the vibrant underwater world. But Sarah felt drawn to a lone stand of mangroves at the beach's edge. Suddenly, a hush fell over the gathered tourists. The captain shouted a warning, his voice edged with urgency. He pointed toward the horizon. At first, Sarah could see nothing. A tropical storm was moving in, frighteningly fast. Everyone scrambled back onto the boat, the initial excitement giving way to a nervous energy as the clouds rushed in. Waves crashed over the deck, soaking everyone to the bone. The captain wrestled with the controls, his face etched with concentration, but it was a losing battle. There was a flash of lightning, an ear-splitting crack of thunder, and the engine died. Panic erupted. Sarah was thrown against the railing, pain exploding in her side. Through the blur of rain and salt water, she saw the boat split in half, the wreckage disappearing into the churning sea. People clung to debris, bobbing among the waves, swept further away with each passing second. Scrabbling, Sarah found a handhold just as the other half of the boat capsized. Then, a lucky break, with a surge, she was tossed onto solid ground, crashing onto the beach. Behind her, she heard cries of terror fade into the relentless howl of the wind. Coughing, her lungs burning, Sarah looked around. Two other figures lay sprawled on the sand, a middle-aged man with blood trickling from a head wound, and a teenage girl wringing the seawater from her long hair. Her initial relief was brutally short-lived. They were stranded, injured, and utterly vulnerable. Scanning the water, her heart sank. Dark fins cut through the waves, sharks drawn by the chaos of the wreck. They were circling, waiting. Survival instinct kicked in. With grunts of effort, they helped each other move, scrambling through the mangroves. Finally, they found a narrow opening, almost like a cave, hidden by dense foliage. It was dark and damp, but at least it was covered. They slumped down, exhaustion washing over them. The man, Thomas, tended to his head wound with a strip torn from his shirt. The girl, Anya, had only minor scrapes, but her eyes were wide with shock. Despite the throbbing pain in her ribs, Sarah was the leader by default. There was no time for self-pity. They inventoried their situation. A half-empty water bottle, a lighter, Thomas's pocket knife, and the tattered remnants of Anya's beach bag. No food, no actual first aid supplies. Outside, the storm raged on. They were trapped, not just on the island, but in their shelter. Moving would attract the shark's attention, despair threatened to overwhelm them. Sarah thought of Lily, her parents' worried faces, and all those they'd already lost. They had to survive. Hours passed. The storm finally abated, leaving a desolate landscape and a relentless sun beating down. Their throats burned with thirst, their injuries ached fiercely. They knew they couldn't stay here. The circling fins in the water served as a constant, deadly reminder. They had to find another way off the island, a chance to signal for help. Venturing deeper into the jungle proved daunting. Each rustle brought fear. Every shadow seemed to conceal a new threat. Yet the relentless drive for survival spurred them on. They discovered edible berries, carefully testing each before risking more than a taste. A trickle of water led them to a small, clear spring, where they refilled their meager bottle. They used leaves and sap to treat their wounds, a poor substitute for proper care but better than nothing. They scavenged debris washed ashore, building a crude raft that barely held together. Yet, every attempt to launch it beyond the reef was met with circling sharks driving them back to the unforgiving island. While gathering driftwood, Thomas spotted a glint on the island's far side. Hope, a fragile and foolish thing in their desperate situation, flared. Their hopes seemed dashed when they found a smashed speedboat, its hull torn open. Then Sarah found it, 
a waterproof container wedged in a compartment. Inside were flares and a small battery-powered radio. Working furiously, they built a signal fire, the smoke a thin trail against the vast sky. With trembling hands, Thomas sent out an SOS repeatedly, their voices hoarse from thirst and fear. Then they waited, then they saw it, a ship, distant but real. They lit the flares, waving them frantically as they screamed themselves raw. But finally, the boat changed course, heading towards them. When the rescue boat reached the beach, the survivors could barely stand. Weak, sunburned, and covered in ragged, salt-crusted clothes. Yet a surge of relief washed over them so powerfully they wept. They survived by luck and their desperate determination to cling to life. The island, once a prison, became a testament to their resilience.